show today bird gets a four taste of the LC 500H that's coming to India next year. Abhay tells you all about the CF Motor 650MT, a new premium motorcycle in the Indian market. And we tell you if the MG Hector with a petrol powertrain makes more sense than the diesel in this market. Hi, welcome to Overdrive. You're watching the show with me, Sohini Dutt. Let me start by wishing you all a very happy Independence Day. And to add a little bit of spark into this weekend, we have a very special coupe from Lexus. Now, Lexus is all set to turn up the heat in the market by introducing a beautiful coupe to its lineup of SUVs and sedans. And uh, Bert got a chance to drive this beautiful coupe in an island in Japan. Here's the LC 500H. Lexus in India offers a diverse range of products, but these have been focused around the sedan and SUV segments so far. And the LC 500H, the sports uh, touring or the grand tourer, will be the first time Lexus India offers a car in this segment. Now, most Lexuses that we've seen have been very distinctly designed, and the LC 500H is no different. Of course, dominant element out here is this spindle grille that we can see. It takes a lot of attention, grabs a lot of attention, and especially because of its design. This is a low slung car and uh, as you look at the spindle grille, you'll see that the density of the honeycomb mesh increases from the bottom going up to the top. Again, the Lexus logo with the blue highlights in there indicates its hybrid uh, powertrain. Coming back towards the side, it's got the LED matrix headlamps out here, 21 inch alloys and tyres and this is the configuration that will come down to India. Now, these are run flat tyres. Of course, that same specification is going to be available in India as well. Again, low slung silhouette. The ground clearance isn't much and this isn't going to change. Uh, Lexus isn't going to make a change for the Indian conditions. You aren't going to get a bad road or a rough road package as such. This is how the car is going to be standing once it comes down to India as well. Towards the rear, we're going to have uh, a active spoiler. Now, again, this configuration hasn't been sealed for the Indian market as of yet. But uh, yes, that could be one of the options available uh, on the LC 500H. Furthermore, at the back, now I don't have the keys to show you how the tail lamp, uh, the tail lamp effect, but essentially it's one LED with several mirrors in there to give you the, to give an infinite effect. So it looks like there are several arrays of LEDs sitting inside this tail lamp unit here. Overall, a very impressive car. Boot space, not too much, but enough for a small couple of, uh, well, strollers to be snugly fitted in there. Otherwise, it's a spectacular looking car. Before I head out on that drive, let me quickly take you through the interiors of the LC 500H. Uh, spectacular interiors and each one is bespoke. These can be customized to whatever your specification is. So while you see a trim here, and this is a static car, but uh, the trim in here has got blue and uh, well uh, beige uh, leather upholstery with a lot of uh, well detailing in it. If you look in the background, I've got this orange Alcantara with the orange inserts, leather inserts as well. So stunning interior nonetheless, some fantastically finished uh, detailing out here. Uh, the gear knob, again, the, the, the buttons on the dashboard, the steering wheel, all of this is fantastic. Some of the highlights for me are, of course, uh, the drive selector. Now, this allows you to select whether you want to be in sport mode or normal or eco mode. And just a sm small knurled knob out here, which you use to select the driving mode. There's a trackpad out here on uh, the center tunnel as well. Now, this trackpad allows you to select various functions on the HMI out here. Uh, and there's a host of features that you can select over there as well. Overall though, kind of luxury and quality that you'd expect in a Lexus is all in here. A stunning place to be and all of it very nicely as you look at it, very nicely focused around the driver. This is something the Europeans used to do uh, very smartly, especially BMW and now Lexus has taken that on as well and uh, is uh, implementing the same functionality in here. All of this area, this is exclusive to the driver as you can see this large wall area well it clearly divides the passenger from the driver's seat now this is a two plus two seater there are two seats at the rear as well but uh, for functionality and for all purposes ideally just two in here there's very little space for the passengers in the back fit and finish is what you'd expect a Lexus to be like and there's just so much of that exacting detail inside this cabin it's just spectacular to be in it the seats are fantastically bolstered the steering wheel feels just so right in your hands 
everything just fits and feels fantastic. So Lexus India will be bringing the LC 500H to India sometime in 2020. Now this is a hybrid and based on the LC platform. Now this is part of the GAL or Global Architecture Luxury Platform. The LC 500H is a sports coupe. Its spiritual predecessor is the LFA. The Lexus LC 500H, however, like I said, is a hybrid. It uses a combination, it's a petrol hybrid motor. It uses a combination of a V6 engine with the two electric motors to deliver a total of 479 horsepower. The V6 ICE engine, the V6 petrol engine, delivers about 299 PS of max power and uh, the two electric motors combined they give out about 179 horsepower. The electric motor, of course, when you start this car, the electric motor is what is used to propel the car forward and then depending on the throttle input, it will shift to the petrol engine. Maximum range on that electric motor is just about 6 kilometers. So it's used in traffic situations, dense traffic situations and of course when you want to start off, uh, when you roll off to a parking lot, you start driving. In stop and go traffic, the hybrid motor, the electric powertrain comes in fairly handy because that's when it's used the most. As you roll off, the electric motor takes over and unless and until you exceed a certain RPM, which in this case is about a thousand RPM, only then the petrol engine will come into play. The electric motor, however, uh, uses uh, has got a range of about six kilometers. And uh, when you start off from a traffic light, for instance, all you can hear is the whine of that electric motor. Out here on the instrument console, there's a very clear display that shows you the kind of charging circuit that is being developed and that's being built or rather it's being utilized. So if you're braking, it clearly indicates to you how the battery is being charged. It also shows you how the battery is then developing or rather delivering power to the driven wheels. And of course, it also indicates when the IC engine comes into play and what that IC engine is doing. So at this point in time, we've got the IC engine that's powering both the, the driven wheels as well as recharging the battery. There's tons of electronics in this car. Safety features, dynamic assistance, a whole lot of stuff that well is intended to keep uh, the LC 500 H tracking its line but it's also a fairly pure car in a sense where you can just switch it into manual mode use the parallel shifts and just enjoy the driving experience like you would in a conventional sports car bear in mind this is a car that is going to cost upwards of one crore rupees so yes the select few will get to enjoy what the lc 500 h has in stock Lexus will be bringing the LC 500H to India sometime next year and we foresee the only challenge that the manufacturer will have in India is to get its pricing right. If they do get the pricing right though, they will make a very compelling case for themselves in the Indian market. Time then for us to take our first break here on the show but come right back overdrive. Now CF Motor is the latest entrant in the rapidly growing premium motorcycle space in the Indian market. And uh, this China-based motorcycle maker has recently launched three new motorcycles, all of which are 650cc middleweight motorcycles. Now, Abhay Varma will get you the report of the 650MT. Until a few months ago, not many people in the country would have known about CF Moto. But CF Moto is a Chinese motorcycle manufacturer who has partnered with Bangalore-based AMW Motorcycle and has launched not one, not two, but three middleweight motorcycles, including this bike here, the 650MT. Now, this motorcycle is positioned as a middleweight, road-biased adventure touring motorcycle. And that said, it takes on the likes of the Kawasaki Versus 650, the Suzuki V-Strom 650 XT, and also the Benelli TRK502. How's the bike ride? Let's find out.
as I mentioned, CF Moto is the newest two-wheel manufacturer in the country, and interestingly, the 650MT's design language is as fresh as the brand itself. An important reason behind this is the fact that the 650MT has been designed in Austria by none other than Kiska Design, the very firm that designs KTM's. Which also explains why the 650MT's fairing reminds us of KTM's ADVs. The face looks more modern than most 650s in the segment, and I also like how the windscreen floats above the fairing while also offering manual adjustability. That said, the fairing and engine protector is a definite eyesore, and I think it could have been designed better. The rear end is quite compact, and I also like the scoop design of the one-piece seat. Overall, the 650MT has a striking appearance thanks to its sharp design, as also the bike's color combination of blue and black. And talking about the paint scheme, I have to mention that while the sheen and the paint quality on the bike are excellent, I cannot say the same about the plastics quality as a lot of the plastics felt below par in terms of the quality. Powering this motorcycle is a 650cc parallel twin liquid cooled engine that offers 71 PS and 62 Newton meters of torque. What's even more interesting here is the fact that it feels very similar in nature to the engine that powers the Kawasaki vs. 650. Of course, both are parallel twin engines, so this does sound a lot like that engine. And apart from that, I also think the power delivery is very similar in nature. I would feel slightly peakier, sporty, and I do certainly like the power delivery on this motorcycle. And the reason behind the similarities to the Kawasaki engine here is the fact that the 650MT's engine is based on the Kawasaki parallel twin. That of course is a good thing, since the Kawasaki engine has always been an impressive motor. The 650MT's powertrain thus impresses, as acceleration is quick, with a noticeable surge towards the top of the rev range. The bike managed the 0 to 100 kmph sprint in just under 5.5 seconds, and the engine continues to pull strongly well beyond the 100 kmph mark and in fact, Getting to and sustaining speeds in the region of 150 km per hour is no problem at all. This also indicates how good the bike's cruising abilities are, and the 650MT has no trouble being ridden at a constant 140 km per hour for extended periods of time, should the conditions permit. The engine also impresses with its performance in the city, as the strong bottom end and mid-range punch allow rapid progress through traffic, though I wish the fueling was crisper at lower revs. What's more, Gear changes from the 6-speed transmission are precise, but could have been lighter. On the whole, the 650MT's powertrain is likeable, though I wish it was slightly more refined than what it is. CF Moto has also equipped the bike with sport and touring modes, and power delivery in touring is softer, but the bike does not get traction control, which is a miss in my opinion. The 650MT is suspended on fat, 50mm upside down forks at the front which offer preload adjustment along with an offset monoshock at the rear and it runs on Metzler Road Tech tyres and these are clear indicators of how road bias the setup is as far as the right hand handling is concerned. The 650MT thus feels very confident be it when cruising at triple digit speeds on the highway or leaning into corners. The Metzler Road Tech tyres offer a very confident feel in conjunction with the firm suspension, especially the 120 section front tyre. In fact, a 120 section front tyre is something you would find only on a litre class superbike which should give you an idea of how much grip the 650MT offers at the front. The front end also offers good feel and feedback, making for a confident feel when riding the bike in traffic. This, coupled with the bike's nimble and light feel, ensures it does not feel heavy despite the 218 kg curb weight. On the other hand, the 650MT calls for caution when riding on broken roads and the bike is clearly happier treading on smooth roads rather than broken ones or off tarmac. What's more, while it certainly impresses in terms of handling, the firm suspension setup results in a ride quality that's not as planned as I would have liked. The 650MT transfers some of the shocks from ruts and potholes to the rider and I would have liked better shock absorption given the bike's positioning as a touring motorcycle. Priced at Rs 4.99 lakh ex showroom, the CF Moto 650MT is certainly an interesting proposition for somebody looking for a middleweight road bias touring motorcycle. I do like the engine performance and I think the dynamics and the ride quality are impressive as well. In that sense, this is a pretty competent motorcycle, but a big question mark at the moment is CF Moto's dealership network in the country and consequently its after sales service network. Well, the build quality is not really great as well, and I think if CF Moto is serious about carving a niche in this uber competitive segment, it really needs to up its game in terms of the dealership network and the build quality of the motorcycle as well.
It's time now for us to check out the servo perfect driving tip for this week. Safety is paramount. So when driving on road, remember don't allow children to fight or climb around in your car. They should be buckled in their seats at all times. Avoid driving when you're tired. Be aware that some medications cause drowsiness and make operating a vehicle very dangerous. And finally, always use an indicator when changing lanes. Cutting in front of someone, changing lanes too fast or not using your signals may cause an accident or upset other drivers. With that, it's time for us to take our final break here on the show. But come right back because on the other side, we'll get you a quick... Welcome back. You're watching Overdrive. Now, even though the MG Hector has sold out for this year, most of you have been eager to find out just how the automatic fares in the real world. So without any further ado, let's just shift driving modes and find out how it does. Diesel fuel, it may not remain the practical choice as it is right now because in the BS6 regime, it is expected to get quite pricey. And then if your commutes are less than 20 kilometers a day, diesel may not make any sense at all to you. That's the reason why the market is shifting towards petrol. That is also the reason why most car makers are now stressing on petrol. Many car makers are also moving out of the diesel game altogether. Now, that's also the reason why we have the Hector petrol back at the OD garage because a lot of you requested a review of the Hector petrol automatic. The engine has a decent output, 143 PS and 250 Newton meters. Now those aren't really very big numbers, but then for a 1.5 liter engine, those are quite healthy. The engine isn't BS6 compliant yet, but will be tuned to meet BS6 emission standards next year. And unlike the diesel, this engine is not likely to see a major price increase. One of the key visual differentiators for the MG Hector petrol automatic is that the internet inside badge is not that huge badge on the fender, it's a tiny little badge on the boot lid and I think I like it this way, it's still a little more subtle than that. Now talking about visuals, uh, there's something that we always complain about when we look at the MG Hector, don't we? Is the puny tyres. Uh, well, those puny tyres are more of a necessity than a design shortcoming. If they would have gone with fatter tyres, they wouldn't have been able to claim the kind of fuel economy figures and the subsequent CO2 emission figures that they're claiming right now. Now I don't have access to the CO2 figures, but the fuel economy figures of the petrol auto, not very optimistic. Even with an ARAS certification, not very optimistic. Only 13.96 kilometers to a litre. And it gets worse when you come to real world figures. We have been running multiple tests on this car in the city, on the highway. And the best that we've averaged out so far is about 8.14 kilometers to a litre in the city and 11.7 kilometers to a litre on the highway. Now the city figures are comparable to the other two cars in this segment, the Compass Automatic, the Petrol Automatic and the Greta Petrol Automatic. But the highway figures, those two cars do much better than the MG Hector. The huge gap in the city and highway figures of these cars show that these are more ideal for highway use and fail to live up to expectations when it comes to city economy. Now people usually expect DCTs to have ultra-fast responses and when they drive these cars, they're usually disappointed because those responses may not be that fast. So dual-clutch transmissions, they use two clutches. One clutch for the even number of gears, the other clutch for the odd number of gears. So compared to a conventional torque converter or an AMT, there is a very short shift time. There's no powering down between shifts and that is why you do not get that head nod or that pause between shifts. That is what makes DCT so interesting because the shifts are very smooth and they are very quick. However, it all works well in theory, but in practice, this only works well with high-performance engines. With smaller engines, smaller turbocharged engines that are now becoming quite common with DCTs, especially from brands like Volkswagen, Hyundai, Kia or even MG, things are quite different. It isn't exactly a marriage made in heaven. So if now you and I are on the same page about how DCTs perform on smaller engines, let's put things in perspective with the Hector Automatic. It has that same weak low-end performance that we just spoke of and under heavy load conditions, it not only feels jerky like some of the other small engine DCTs, but there's also a pronounced juddering from the powertrain and the drivetrain and that is something that I didn't expect from this car. Surprisingly, in similar scenarios like slowing down for a roundabout or attempting an overtake from city speeds, our Hector test car was completely powering down even with the accelerator pressed down. 
and would take a massive two second pause before powering on again. That would not only catch us off guard but it was also a safety hazard. So if you are in the market for a Hector Automatic, make sure that you test drive one extensively before committing to it. The diesel Hector in comparison feels much better put together, feels like a much wholesome product in that sense. This one still feels like it has a few rough edges. Once you're at speed, the 6-speed automatic is extremely smooth in its shifts like you would expect in a DCT. Add to it a fairly refined engine and the sound insulation which is done up by 3M and you have a cabin that feels quite premium with its silence. So because this is the automatic variant, it also allows you to use the remote start function on the app on your phone. Which means you can start the car remotely, pre-cool the cabin before you're going to leave for your work or you want to start your journey and that's a good way to start the journey. That is if the connectivity works. I know I'm just repeating myself every time I am reviewing a car with connected technologies, always saying, but if the technology works, but if the connectivity works, but I can't help it. I have to be the devil's advocate. I have to bring these things up. This particular infotainment for the last two days is refusing to latch onto the network and I don't know how to fix it. There's nothing in the settings menu that tells me what's going wrong. So yes, if it works, it works. Well, to sum it up, I think the diesel Hector is still the best package of the lot in this lineup. It's got a practical engine, it's a punchy engine, it's good fun to drive and it's also got good driving dynamics compared to the petrol. The petrol variant has an equally cushy ride but in terms of handling manners, it feels a bit too light on its feet and sometimes wallowy at speed. But if you're particularly looking for a petrol Hector, then the hybrid manual could make more sense, especially if your daily commutes are between 15 to 20 kilometers. With its hybrid assistance, it has a better range and a relatively stronger low end. There are of course better alternatives in this particular segment if you want a petrol automatic. There is the Kia Seltos that we recently drove. It's a fabulous gearbox. It's a fabulous package overall. But if you necessarily need the big size, the Hector is probably the better car to go for. And right now, in this particular size, in the petrol automatic space of this segment, the Hector Automatic virtually has no competition. I would personally avoid the Hector 1.5 Automatic. While the rest of the package is impressive, the inconsistent gearbox and the weak engine performance are a big letdown for me. And therefore, despite all the uncertainty surrounding the diesels, I would personally still make a choice between the diesel automatic variants of the Creta or the Seltos or go with the Hector diesel manual if I wanted size over everything else. That's it then from us on this week's episode of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook as well as Twitter and you can follow our latest updates on our YouTube channel. You can also follow our updates on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye and many thanks for watching.